Uh, good evening, everyone, and we are very sorry to keep you on hold. Now we are actually starting our program. So, uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Before I start and proceed the program, I would like to make a humble request to everyone to kindly keep your videos on and microphone in mute to avoid interruption. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm Tenzin Dogma, Program Coordinator of Tibet House. And I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to our speaker, a renowned scholar from Thelma the Buddhist Philosophy, Professor Sangatila Gratne, founder, head of the Department of Buddhist Studies at University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Our chairperson, Dr. Kaviri Gill, professor at Shipnadar University, Great, Greater Noida. And all gathered here to our virtual 31st annual Patnipani lecture on body, mind, and purification in Buddhism, reflections on the body factor in the path. Now I would like to give a brief introduction about this lecture. Annual Padmapani Lecture is one of the most important academics e academic events of Tibet House. They are delivered by leading scholars coming all around the world who have made an outstanding contribution in their respective fields, be it education, ethics, psychology, science, Buddhist philosophy, and etc. The title of the lecture series evoked the idea of universal understanding and harmony. Now I would like to share a brief introduction about our chairperson before I uh, proceed with uh, Dr. Kavrila. Doc Dr. Kavrili Kaviri Gill is an associate professor at Shipnadar University, Greater Noida, teaching the political economy of development. She has worked in a range of spheres, including with the Planning Commission, Government of India, UNICEF, the International Development Research Center, and, and Oxford Policy Management. She has published widely, including a monograph with Oxford University Press. Her research interests include poverty and the informal sector, urban waste, water and sanitation issues, and public policy in varied social sectors, especially in public health. She is also enrolled for the six-year Nalanda Master's course in Buddhist philosophy at Tibet House, New Delhi. Now I would like to request Dr. Kavrila to kindly proceed this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Domala uh, Tukchina. So uh, welcome to uh, the audience. Um, apologies for the slight delay. Uh, um, it's one of the things we have to deal with in this pandemic age with IT. Uh, so um, I would like to introduce our esteemed speaker today. Uh, so we have with us, we are very fortunate to have with us Professor Asanga Tilakaratne who at present is with the School of Religious Studies, Philosophy and Comparative Religion um, at Nalanda University, Rajgir, Bihar, uh, is a former senior chair professor of Pali and Buddhist studies and the founder head of the Department of Buddhist Studies at the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, in 1999-2000, Professor Tilakaratne was a a Commonwealth Fellow and was attached to the Oriental Institute, Oxford University. During 2003 to 2006, he served as the Director of the Postgraduate Institute of Pali and Buddhist Studies, University of Kelaninia. He has served as a Visiting Professor at Yonsei University, Korea, Otaga University, New Zealand, Savitri Bhai Pule, Pune University, India, Soumya Vidya Vihar, Mumbai, India, and Sitagu International Buddhist Academy in Myanmar. He has published both in Sinhala and English more than 100 papers on Buddhist studies. Of his more recent academic works, Theravada Buddhism, The View of the Elders, was published in 2012 by the University of Hawaii Press in a series on the dimensions of Asian spirituality, he has also co-edited with Professor Oliver uh, Abinayaka, 2,600 Years of Sambuddhatva, 
A Global Journey of Awakening, also in 2012, which is a work that covers the history and current status of global Buddhism of all three traditions. So we are very fortunate to have um, him with us today. And he is going to speak about the body, mind, and purification, reflections on the body factor in the path. So uh, this is going to be about that there's a long-standing debate in the Indian tradition on the relative primacy of mind and body in the process of liberation. And of course, today we have with us um, uh, esteemed Venerable Geshela, the director of Tibet House, who has also been teaching us fortunate students Pramana Vaktika. So there's a lot that we can think about in this context. Uh, so the popular belief has been that the body has to be tamed, punished and tortured in order for one to attain liberation from all bondages. The widespread practices of self-mortification found across religious traditions, not only in India, but also in other parts of the world, testify to this belief. In brief, the body has been seen as the problem. In the sphere of religion, the dawn of Buddhism may be described as the beginning of the psychological turn in religious practice. The Buddha placed emphasis on mental acts over the physical and verbal acts and highlighted the role of mind in the process of purification. Again, as opposed to the emphasis on physical purification by some of his contemporaries. One could interpret the Buddhist position as advocating mind over body to promote mind at the expense of body. This leads us to two questions. What is the Buddhist position on mind and body relationship? And what is the Buddhist attitude to body in general and in Buddhist soteriology in particular? These are the two issues that will be explored in today's paper. So with that, I extend a warm welcome on behalf of Tibet House and our audience. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, so over to you, Professor Tilakaratne. Okay, can you hear me? Very good uh, evening to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kaveri Gil. Um, for this uh, very uh, elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, it's always a challenge when you get such introduction to live up to it. So um, let me uh, try my best. Uh, distinguished um, guest, Geshe Doji Damdul, director of uh, Tibetan Institute, and all the other uh, distinguished guests present. First, um, let me apologize for uh, this delay. Actually, uh, uh, it is uh, I'm the one who is responsible for the delay, not the Tibet uh, uh, the house. Uh, things were working perfectly well about 3.30 in the afternoon, but, you know, things change. So something happened, and but anyhow, anyhow, um, we, are, we are here. Um, so... Uh, I should begin by thanking uh, uh, Tibet House and Geshe um, Damdul uh, for inviting for inviting me for this uh, very important and also very prestigious uh, lecture conducted by uh, Tibet House. Uh, we know that uh, we were planning to do this uh, 2020 when I was uh, in. Uh, Nalanda University, uh, Rajkir. But then, of course, uh, we all started uh, sharing this uh, very challenging and difficult period. And uh, we are still uh, in this difficult period. So we will be uh, coming out from this. So uh, at last, uh, uh, I'm sure you are also happy. I'm also happy that uh, we could meet at least um, online. Uh, to uh, uh, conduct this uh, talk and you know share some of the views. So with this um, introduction, uh, let me get into my uh, topic for this evening. Uh, as you heard, it is uh, body, uh, mind, and uh, purification, um, which is a very, uh, I would say, uh, widely discussed uh, subject in uh, uh, particularly in, in Indian philosophy uh, 
in general and then also in buddhist philosophy uh, hindu philosophy and not only that uh, world over uh, there is uh, the the widespread uh, discussion about it and then today particularly with uh, uh, neuroscientific uh, discoveries this debate has been uh, you know i mean has received renewed uh, interest uh, among the scholars we know that uh, his holiness dalai lama uh, has been a pioneer uh, particularly in, the, in in you know in this aspect of uh, modern modern research uh, in my presentation however uh, basically coming from uh, theravada buddhist tradition i will be looking at this uh, problem from basically a theravada perspective because as uh, many of you are uh, expert in uh, tibetan buddhist tradition you know that there is so much um, uh, on this subject uh, in tibetan buddhist tradition and also in um, modern um, uh, science and also in philosophy but in the in this lecture today i am not going to uh, go into all these things because you know that is unrealistic and at the same time i am not that expert to talk about uh, you know the deep tibetan buddhist tradition so let me uh, sort of confine myself to a area where i am more comfortable but uh, looking from broader buddhist uh, philosophical point of view it will be interesting for you to know what the what we call theravada tradition or the um, early buddhist uh, tradition what does it think about this uh, theme so um, this is what i'm uh, trying to articulate uh, this uh, evening um, will i be able to see my powerpoint presentation uh, so basically the idea is that um, uh, when you take body uh, in order for you, you to be uh, uh, to be liberated that uh, the idea is that body has to be trained and also controlled and uh, also there is a popular view in the society uh, to the effect that if you are caring about body too much then you are not a serious person and if you are a serious person then you don't care about your body very much now uh, you know in uh, in popular perception uh, if you are supposed to be a philosopher now you can't have your hair neatly cut and you know oiled and uh, combed you have to be sufficiently fussy looking otherwise you are not a philosopher so if you are very well dressed or something again you are not a philosopher so in order for you to be a philosopher you have to look uh, uh, sufficiently uh, you know chaotic now the whole thing and i i see this not only among philosophers even if you take an athlete or sportsman now you know the public uh, this thing they like to show that they are in their sweating suit uh, you know and they expect us to tolerate them when they are travel in the bus or something and if you are a painter you would like to go around you know with the painting all over your body so you know this this whole aspect of that if you are a serious person you have to be you can't be caring about body now actually the the why i thought of discussing this subject from um, uh, early buddhist point of view is i can i could always see that of course you know i myself uh, thought that you know that is uh, uh, that, that that's that, that's the very you know the valid way to appear to be a philosopher but at the same time more, more and more i read early buddhist text and why uh, more when i get familiar with uh, buddhist tradition i felt that uh, uh, you know this is not the exactly the right way now as you know okay this is how i i mean uh, entered into this subject now uh, going from there we know that uh, uh, in philosophy we have a uh, mind body problem 
Now, mind-body problem, the connection between mind and body. Now, this has been a very important problem in, uh, in, in Western philosophy. Now, in Western philosophy, we talk about uh, Cartesian dualism, where you know, the mind and body were separated. And then mind was identified with more um, like religion and mystical things and you know things like that. And then the body was identified with uh, uh, science, science and other things. So th th there was... Uh, historical mission for um, René Descartes to, to separate the two and, you know, put mind in one side and uh, body in another side. And then ever since, you know, people have been uh, debating this issue. So, uh, so that, is, that is one way to look at it. Now, uh, so it is a, it's a wide area, but uh, basically looking at, uh, looking from a Buddhist point of view, uh, what is the approach of Buddhism to body. How would it look at uh, this mind-body issue? Uh, would it really articulate uh, things in uh, terms of uh, uh, mind and body? Now, these are some of the issues I would be discussing. And particularly, uh, when you think about uh, your attitude to body, uh, religions in general have been uh, looking uh, as I try to uh, indicate at the beginning, uh, somewhat negatively at the uh, human body. And then uh, you know that uh, most of the religious people have been men, and then they also have been looking at uh, female body even, more ne body even more negatively. So you know the, the general attitude to human body and also the attitude to um, uh, the, the, the opposite body, you know, these are, these are some of the uh, is issues that arise from this. Uh, let me just uh, stop for a second and see whether my uh, uh, PowerPoint could be, is it visible to you? Okay. Okay. Uh, the theme would have given as human personality and purification not as it is given here as referring to two phenomena, body and mind. Mind-body problem, which is called Cartesian dualism, is a prominent issue in modern Western philosophy. Separation of mind from body and living. And uh, the concept of embodiment. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, okay, we will go into the next one and also um, the next one, please. Uh, okay, next one. Okay, the negative attitude to body is shared by both Eastern and Western religions. In the Indian context, Brahmanism and Jainism, including many forms of Shravana traditions, are known to advocate this view. The Indian expression of this idea is that happiness has to be attained by means of uh, suffering. Providing rationale for self mortification by such Vrutas as Ajavruta, Govruta, and Kukura Vruta. Now, uh, I think uh, I don't need to go into very much uh, detail into this because you know that uh, the various forms of uh, uh, punishing the body has been widely uh, practiced in the Indian tradition. Now, as you can see now, not only in the Indian tradition, in the Christian attitude to flesh. St. Jerome, who spent four years in Syrian desert in self-mortification. Now, the, I'm, I'm quoting from B.C. Mackenzie, uh, the uh, cave in the snow. Uh, let me quote it. I found myself surrounded by bands of dancing girls. My face was pale with fasting. But though my limbs were cold as ice, my mind was burning with desire. And forces of lust keep bubbling up before me when my flesh was as good as dead. Then he flagellated himself in repentance. Okay, now, uh, this is uh, another uh, religious experience in the, in the Christian tradition, where, again, you think that uh, the real issue is the problem. So, you know, you go on fasting and then finally spending all four years there, and then uh, the, the finally, you can see um, uh, flagellating uh, his own body. 
as as punishment. So uh, you can see that this is uh, not only Indian phenomenon or uh, Hindu or Buddhist or Jaina phenomenon, but you know the phenomenon you see across. But on the other hand, I will come to this point later. This this quotation shows that uh, body is not really the problem. Uh, mind is the problem. But anyhow, we will move into next one, please. Uh, Jainas believe that the past karmas have to be burned. Uh, I refer to the Mahadukkha Kanda Sutti in the Vajjimanikaya. The view attributed to Jains that physical action is more serious than verbal and mental actions. Now this comes in the Upari Sutti in the Vajjimanikaya. This idea that you know, the, the, the actions, verbal actions, physical actions and mental actions. Now, Buddhism is trying to say that mental actions are the most fundamental, but Jaina tradition has been attributed with this idea in the Buddhist literature that uh, uh, the physical actions are more powerful. Now, physical purity and impurity due to external reasons is very popular in the Brahman tradition. Now, physical contact with so-called untouchables by sharing water, vessels, etc., with such untouchables and getting in contact with women at uh, unclean days. You know, all, all these are there. The, again, the idea is that, um, uh, you know, the physical uh, purity and impurity due to uh, external reasons. So, you, you, you know, there is, uh, you know, the very widespread uh, cult uh, based on that. And a uh, Brahmana view of water purification, Udakena Suddhi, Pali term. Uh, there is an episode in um, uh, the Buddhist literature about uh, Punna, a slave girl, in conversation with a Brahmin who was practicing Udaka Suddhi. Uh, that means uh, water purification in a very um, cold uh, early morning, uh, dipping in Ganges. You know, then uh, this slave girl was asking uh, why you are doing this. Then the Brahman's response was that, you know, he was doing it uh, for the purification. Now, the story, of course, you know, putting from the Buddhist point of view, uh, um, you know, somewhat ridicule in the Brahmin uh, for doing it. But uh, the, the point here is not the ridiculing, ridiculing part, but the, the whole idea of the story, like purification, a purification of body, purification by water. Now, uh, you know, these are, uh, in a sense, age-old traditions, not only found in um, Indian tradition, you find it in Sri Lankan tradition, you find it in African traditions, you know, in many traditions, you find, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this type of um, uh, beliefs. So the whole point is that, uh, the purification of the body and purification of the body by external means. And also you get uh, you get dirty or you get impure by touching certain group of people, you know, things like that. And also particularly, uh, you know, the, concerning the women, you know, they consider that there are certain good days and certain bad days for them to be uh, entering into the holy places, you know, this, this kind of beliefs. Now, all these are based on the idea of physical purity and impurity, and then physical purity and impurity uh, extending into ultimately the, the religious domain and the uh, matters of uh, ultimate liberation. So that is, that, that is the important uh, aspect of that. Uh, next one, please. Now, there is another interesting incident. When the Buddha concluded the sermon on Similion cloth, a Brahmin named Sundarika Bharadwaja asked whether the Buddha um, wished to go to the Bahuka river for a bath. Then Buddha's response was, what can Bahuka river do? The Buddha asked said, a foolish person may forever bath, yet will not purify dark deeds. Now here you can see the, the Buddha is um, turning this whole idea. Uh, I'm sure the Brahmin asked, uh, make the innocent request. Okay, why don't we go to the Bahuka river for a bath, for purification? Uh, you know, that is understandable in that context. But here you can see Buddha turning it into a uh, sort of a psychological thing. Because idea is that uh, uh, if you have uh, your dark deeds, 
however much purified water or pure water, holy water will not uh, be able to uh, wash you. So um, that is the idea. And then uh, there are many instances. Now here I quote Dhammapada, uh, by not wandering naked, no matted locks, no filth, no fasting, no lying on the ground, no dust, no ashes, no striving, sweating on the, on the heels can purify a mortal who has not overcome doubts. Now again, you can see that Buddha is referring to all types of um, practices. Still you find among the religious people, still you find. So the basic idea, I think, I think uh, very clear, uh, this um, physical austerities were rejected by the Buddha. Now in his own life, how did he come to this understanding? Uh, we are told that he spent long six years practicing uh, uh, Dushkara Kriya or self-mortification. And uh, he did it to the uh, I mean, to the extreme, and then uh, having done it, did not find that uh, you know he was uh, any more advanced uh, uh, in the path. So finally, he he, he thought of uh, giving it up. Okay. So next one, please. Now again, this is um, the the how would the you know the the you know, criticize this idea. What is the use of your matted hair, O wiseless man? What is the use of your antelope skin garment? Within you are full of passions. Without, you embellish yourself. Now, again, you can see that you do quite a lot of things in the, in, in, uh, externally, but uh, what is the use of that so long as you are full of these things internally? Okay, uh, next one, please. In the Dhamma Chakrapatana Sutta, in the first sermon, the Buddha rejects two views connected with the attitude to body, namely self mortification, Atta Kilamata Anu Yoga, Atma Klamatha, and self indulgence, uh, Kama Sukalika Anu Yoga. The first, which is described as Dukkha Anariya Anatta Sangita, painful, ignoble, and producing harmful results, and the latter as Low, vulgar, and worldly. Now, in this uh, adjectives Buddha using, you can see there is a difference. Buddha would not use uh, this uh, last three adjectives, low, vulgar, and worldly, to describe uh, self mortification, because he himself knew that in order to practice self mortification, uh, you need enormous courage uh, in your mind. So Buddha doesn't uh, use those things. But he says it is dukkha, it's painful. And anari, it is not noble. And anatta sangit, it can lead to um, uh, you know, the wrong results. So uh, still they are between the two extremes. But the important thing is both extremes have to do with the physical body. On the one hand, you are uh, torturing your body. On the other hand, I mean, like uh, other aspect is that you are pampering your body. So one is, you know, the one, one, one way to uh, look at your body, I mean, treat your body. Uh, the other is, you know, total opposite way to. Now here Buddha says both these are extremes, anta. Now that is, I, I would consider is very important to understand. Now this is supposed to be the Buddha's very first um, sermon to the world. Uh, you know, the first five disciples. So where he outlines, because you can see that his own disciples, I mean, would be disciples, uh, were coming from very uh, strong uh, uh, Dushkara Kriya, self mortificatory background. They, in fact, left the Buddha according to the story when Buddha started, uh, uh, you know, adopting to a regular life, taking a bath and having a meal. And then this, People thought that, okay, he's uh, done for and there is no point of being associated with him. So here you can see that in this very first sermon. So Buddha described these two extremes to be avoided by renounced person, Pabajitena. In his pre-Buddhahood life, the Buddha experienced both extremes and rejected both. Because as a prince, we are told that, you know, he had a very uh, uh, luxury life. 
So he gave up that. And then he went to the other extreme. And then again, he went to the extreme of that. And uh, having experienced both, the idea is that, you know, he rejected it. That's one place. The presence of external signs. Now, this is another aspect of this whole uh, concern for physical aspect. Now, presence of external signs, physical marks, holding particular objects, wearing special garments, etc., indicative of the position rejected in, in, in Buddhism. Now, again, you can see, uh, now these are associated with uh, uh, various different religious traditions. Now, who you are is uh, uh, presented by what you are wearing or what you are not wearing. So it, it could go either way. Uh, sometimes you have these old ornamented things you are wearing and holding special um, uh, objects and, you know, all kinds of garments and all that. So that is, uh, again, you, you know, it goes across religions. So that is one way to do that, one thing. But the opposite thing is ultimately you reduce all your garments and clothes and finally uh, you come to a totally uh, naked person wearing nothing, uh, I mean, holding nothing. So, you know, you can see that again, the two diametrically opposed responses. Now in the Buddhist tradition, no external signs show that one is a religious person, but they did not have any specific external things. There was something in the Buddha that Pukkusati could specifically notice. There was nothing uh, he could notice when he was sharing the same potter soul. Now, of course, this I would like to um, comment a little bit uh, religiously, I mean, we know that uh, people who are living religious life, they adhere to a different sort of garment, different sort of dress. I mean, uh, I think we are not referring to that. Uh, here we are referring to all the other more elaborate external things. And uh, in the Buddhist tradition, there is something very, very interesting uh, about this young person called uh, Pukkusati. Now this Pukkusati was a young person, according to the story, who heard about the Buddha and he wanted to come and meet him. So, you know, being India, such a huge country, you now this man was um, walking a long distance. So one day he happened to be sleeping uh, in uh, Potter's Hall, Kumbha Sala, because the, 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 they are the people who had, it seems, you know, large halls. So he was spending night there. And then Buddha was also traveling and he happened to be also spending night there. Now these two people were lying side by side. And then in the night, uh, they got into uh, uh, some kind of discussion. So Buddha had a talk with this young person and then he discovered that he was going to meet him. But the Buddha did not reveal who he was. Continued the discussion. And finally, Buddha turned it into some kind of deeper and deeper Dhamma discussion. And then only Pukkusati realized that uh, this is the very same person he was going to uh, meet. Now, this story shows that apart from talking to the Buddha and finally realizing that he was talking to somebody with a deep um, philosophical insight, there was no physical sign in the Buddha. You know, I mean, because Buddha was like any other Shravana uh, in, in the Indian tradition. So uh, basically that attitude. Now, again, of course, Buddhism as a religion has evolved through many different cultures, many different periods. And, you know, today we have assumed uh, many types of external, uh, uh, you know, the the external manifestations, you know, the clothes and, you know, the objects and things like that, they are found in Buddhist tradition also. Uh, so we are talking about Buddhism as uh, established religion. And I'm not, uh, uh, I mean, don't misunderstand, I'm not criticizing them or anything like that. But what I'm trying to say to you is that uh, the, the at very early period, the whole idea was that uh, if you are a religious person, I mean, there is no external uh, th things uh, other than your simplicity, uh, just to show that you are such a big religious person or not big religious person. Okay, so that's the idea. Moving to the next one, please. So the body, mind and purification now. Buddhist attitude to body. 
Buddhism does not advocate either pampering or, pampering or decorating or disfiguring body. In the monastic rule, we have uh, uh, mala, gandha, vilepana, dharana, mandana, vibhusana, thana, veramani, refraining from all kinds of decorations and perfumes given as the part of the proper behavior. So the proper behavior for a Buddhist uh, follower of the Buddha, Buddhist monk, I mean, monastic follower of the Buddha is to uh, refrain from mala, gandha, vilepana, all these garlands, flowers, anjans, uh, perfumes. However, taking bath, cleaning of body, cleaning of robes, keeping the surroundings clean, properly treating monastic objects, furniture, utensils, etc., are emphasized. Frequent references to the Buddhas having bath in the rivers, etc., refer to any accounts of various um, vata duties associated with monastic residence. Now, uh, uh, again, I'm not going to give you, uh, I mean, make a very detailed um, uh, account here, but, you know, very interesting thing is, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, for example, taking bath. Now, taking bath is a physical aspect. Now, there are so many um, uh, the references to Buddha taking bath in a river, uh, Buddhist disciples taking bath in rivers. And um, of course, we know that uh, the Buddhist tradition had uh, the, the, the bhikkhuni or the bhikshuni female monastic tradition uh, in a very strong manner. And for the female monastic uh, monastics also, you can see in the Vinaya, physical purity has been, cleanliness has been something very, very important. Now, again, I want to contrast this with, you know, the popular religiosity. Now, if you are spending time with your body, you know, cleaning your body, cleaning your teeth, you know, that's not supposed to be very religious or very um, deep religiously, uh, significant. But here you can see this tradition where uh, taking bath, cleaning body, cleaning robes, you know, these are to be very, very uh, important. Uh, for me, the whole point is this. Now, suppose you are meditating. In order for you to meditate, to calm down your mind, uh, your body also has to be clean and uh, supple and also, uh, you know, the the, 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 without any uh, external uh, disturbances. So therefore, to uh, take a bath, uh, to have clean robes, to have a clean surrounding, you know, all these things are uh, accepted in Buddhism. And also, all these things have been given as a part of the monastic life. I would say here, now this uh, attitude is again, you can contrast with the popular religious attitude where cleanliness uh, is you know, not really considered. And Visuddhi Magga, on preparation for meditation, physical and environmental cleanliness, the Visuddhi Magga is the, you know, later the sixth century work on, you know, the manual of um, meditation and, you know, the Buddhist uh, path to purity. It, it has really long uh, accounts of how physical and environmental cleanliness is conducive for uh, meditation. One may practice uh, Asubha Bhavana. Meditation on foulness of body, but one does not need to be physically unclean to do so. Now again, you know, something very interesting. In the Buddhist meditation, we have a meditation called Asubha Bhavana. Asubha. Subha, opposite is Asubha. Now Asubha Bhavana is meditation on filthiness or foulness of the body. So how you meditate is you, uh, you know, identify various aspects hair, nail, teeth, you know, all these things separately. And, you know, try to perceive uh, body as foul thing. Uh, so the whole idea is because we are so uh, attached to our body, so the Asubha Bhavana is meant to show that ultimately you have to give up your desire for your, you know, the attachment to your body. Now, in order to do that, what Buddhism does is, this Asubha Bhavana is prescribed. Now, particularly this Asubha Bhavana is prescribed for those people who are who have uh, very uh, severe 
attachment to their body and also the, uh, the other bodies, opposite uh, sex or whoever. Now, so in order to uh, uh, develop your mind and get rid of that, Asubha Bhavana is prescribed. But the important thing is, in order to practice Asubha Bhavana, you don't have to be unclean. See, that, that's the important thing. Physically, you have to be clean in the sense uh, sufficiently clean. Your body has to be sufficiently clean so that your body is not really uh, disturbing your meditation. But at the same time, you are meditating on uh, asubha with the foulness of the body. Another point I would like to mention in this context is now very often I see in the uh, sometimes in the writing on uh, uh, I would say on uh, female body, uh, I see that uh, sometimes people write that in Buddhist tradition, uh, female bodies, you know, this Asubha Bhavana is about female body or something. Actually, that is not the, that is not the thing. Asubha Bhavana is not about female body or male body, but body in general. So basically, Asubha Bhavana is directed to your own body. And at the same time, Asubha Bhavana can be directed to the, if you are a male, and if you are, if you, you are this size for the female body, then of course you can also look at the female body as a foul thing. And if you are a, a female uh, monastic person or female meditator, then your subject will be could be the male uh, physical body. So this is not at all a male or female body. Now, if you look at how the meditation has been articulated, you can see that it doesn't refer to male or female body, it refers only to human body. So you look at the human body as a super. So the, the connection between how body, mind, and purification are connected. So this uh, concept of asubha, how it connects uh, to meditation is you know, very important. Could we move into the next? And then, the attitude to food. Now, neither overeating nor starvation. Um, refer to pachavekkana. Pratyaveksha. So the, how do you take meal? In the Buddhist tradition, again, you are not overeating, you are not supposed to be with gluttony. Uh, at the same time, you are not supposed to be uh, starving yourself. Now, uh, I, I put here an interesting story I heard of a modern uh, Thai meditation master. Uh, you know, he, he had been traveling with a large group of monks. And um, without his knowledge, he had passed this 12 o'clock. Usually Buddhist monks are supposed to take their midday meal uh, just before the noon. So noon had passed. And the, his followers, out of respect to the master, they did not um, remind him of this. So the time passed. And then finally this master realized that time for the midday meal has been gone, but in a whole large group of people are now in hunger. Then what this master did was, he asked at what point did they pass the uh, midday point? Then, you know, they said, okay, at a particular certain village or some place, you know, by that uh, they passed the midday, uh, you know, the cutoff point. Then he, what he did was, he traveled with all the group to that point and then had lunch. Now, you know, you know that this is ridiculous because, you know, anyway, time is passed. But, you know, the whole attitude is that uh, uh, if you have to take your meal, now you are taking your meal in order to keep your life, in order to keep your meditation practice. So uh, you take your meal. So simply because uh, uh, midday is passed, if you could not take your meal, you should not be starving according to this tradition. So this whole story is, so this concept of Pachavekkana, Pratyaveksha. Now, it important thing is it indicates that body is a necessary condition for one to attain Dirvana. Now, I will come to this point gradually. Now, um, if you are starving, you can't be concentrating. 
So you have to keep your body in the sense, you know, in a certain uh, proper situation that uh, fit to fit for your meditation. And the same thing, similar thing attitude to dress. Chivara, that means the monastic robe, has a pattern. Refer to the Sekhya rules on how to wear the robe in particular when entering a village. The Buddhist monastic dress and demeanor is asexual. This is because ultimately Buddhism advocates going beyond gender orientation. Now, again, this when we talk about the about uh, male and female uh, categories, you know, the dress is something very important. And it is very interesting to see that Buddhist monastic uh, dress or the chivara is same for both male and female monastic members. So there is no, of course, uh, you know, undergarments are different naturally, but the outer robe is no different from for both male and female monastic members. Now, ultimately, uh, in, in the Buddhist tradition, you can see that uh, the both male and female monastic members shave their heads, shave their moustache, and, you know, shave their eyebrows and, you know, entire thing. Now, when you shave all these things and wear uh, identical uh, dress or robe, actually your maleness or femaleness is not that visible. Because you, you come into a... Uh, now, this is, according to my understanding, I think this is uh, something going beyond the sexual um, gender orientations. Now, gender is usually identified with, uh, you know, the one factor is the clothes we wear. Now, here in the monastic tradition, you can see both groups wear similar things. So, in that sense, a dress is not something, uh, you know, the identifier of the gender. But uh, then uh, the pratyaveksha or the reflection I referred to earlier with regard to food, also similar reflections are applicable to the wearing robe. In wearing your robe, you always think that I wear this, this robe in order to cover my body, in order to protect myself from heat and cold and you know things like that. So for those basic purposes, you wear clothes and things like that. And Again, also you can see that Buddha's concern for the cultured life in eating, drinking, wearing dress, walking, sitting, etc. Usually disregarded by ascetics who give scanty regard for this worldly existence. How can this Buddha's attitude be explained? Now, not only this, we know that uh, Buddha, Buddha's origin was uh, uh, princely, I mean royal family. Uh, we know that there must uh, surely must have been the culture, how to eat, how to dress, how to sit, you know, how to talk, how to respond to people, and all these things. And we can see that Buddha brings in these things to the Buddhist monastic tradition in particular. And then Buddha saw that the Buddhist monks are supposed to be um, wearing their clothes very properly, sitting properly, eating and drinking properly. You are not uh, supposed to make any noises when you are eating or drinking. Now, all these things are given in detail in the Vinaya. Now, one would wonder, what is the connection of these things with attaining Nirvana? Now, this is the interesting thing. So, on the one hand, uh, you are following a decent cultured life. So it doesn't, uh, in other words, it doesn't mean that by following a Buddhist path, you are really disgusted of your own life and disgusted of your own, I mean, disgusted of the whole world and other people. It is not that. So, you know, the, this, this combination is something very interesting. On the one hand, you are trying to be detached from all the um, pleasurable things and, you know, the uh, objects of sensual desire. But that doesn't mean that you are hating them. Also, that doesn't mean that you are really uh, running away from the cultured, civilized uh, life. So, in other words, uh, in Buddhism, you can see that an, uh, a monastic person is presented in a radically different way. 
this monastic person is not somebody who is really running from life and you know showing that he is fed up with all these things in his face now when you look at the face of course um, i will uh, we will see it again uh, they are really not that so they basically follow the cultured ways of doing things so how can this buddhist attitude be explained next one now here we come to the uh, focal uh, point the purification is basically a psychological process external purification of pollution rejected by the buddha we know that purity uh, partly this position comes from the buddhist understanding of body according to the buddha all human body share a set of characteristics uh, like uh, born from parents fed with food perishable and impermanent now these are these characteristics are shared by all human bodies all human bodies are born from parents fed with food perishable and they are impermanent and due to this commonality there cannot be any distinction among bodies now i would like to um, lay a little bit emphasis on this now uh, you take all bodies i mean you can take human bodies or you can take bodies of all beings now all bodies share these characteristics now from that point of view we can say that there are no sacred bodies or profane bodies in the buddhist tradition of course again what i am saying is going uh, somewhat against the uh, grain of you know the subsequent buddhist traditions where we worship the physical relics of the buddha and you know those things have to be explained in some but different manner but basically if you look at human body uh, as subject to uh, with certain characteristics and as subject to certain phenomena then of course you can make a distinction between whether it is a male body or female body whether it is a sacred body or profane body i mean body is a body all bodies are healing all bodies decay and then all people ultimately die now um, in the theravada buddhist tradition particularly if you are familiar with the mahaparinirvana sutra mahaparinibbana sutta we know that uh, we are told that uh, finally when buddha was approaching his uh, last uh, days of his life his physical body was so fragile and weak and then finally uh, maybe due to unclean water he had diarrhea and you know, i mean all these things are in detail given in the in, in the in, in the discourses but the interesting thing is this for this discourse after about 500 years when uh, commentator was writing commentary he tries to minimize these things even though this course says that buddha's body was very fragile and weak commentary says that no 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 there was nothing externally to be seen in the buddha's body buddha was perfect looking perfectly okay now this is the commentarial tradition but if you look at the um basic text you can see that there was no hiding of the fact that buddha's body had become very weak so all the bodies become very weak all the bodies share similar things including that of the buddha now this position comes partly from the understanding that impurity which is root cause of suffering has deep psychological roots now ultimately we are talking about uh, uh, impurities when the buddhist term kilesa pali klesha sanskrit so the 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 pleasures are defilements or impurities are basically and fundamentally psychological i mean they have deep psychological roots so um, purification i mean in the indian tradition you know this is something very very uh, popular concept you know the purification i earlier referred to purification by water but here you know something very interesting buddha is referring uh, the by purification he basically means visuddhi or vishuddhi purification is basically the psychological purification could we go into the next one now um, we have what is called sevenfold purification basically relates to mind and also we have this dabbapada stanzas 
uh, which I'm not going to go into detail, which says transient are all conditioned things. When this with wisdom one discerns, then one disgusted with ill. This is the path to purity. Sorrowful are all conditioned things, non-substantial are all phenomena. Ultimately, this is the path to purity. Now here you see the path to purity has been described in essentially psychological terms and also epistemological terms. So when you understand that things are transient, things are unsatisfactory, things are non-substantial, then only you attain purity. So to attain purity is psychological, mental development associated with knowledge. So in this concept, context, Visuddhi purification is described as a, as a result from insight, Panyaya Pasati, Pragnaya Pasati. So you see this uh, through Pragna, wisdom. By seeing from wisdom, you attain purity. So the connection is something very, very interesting. So purity or purification is a psychological thing. And by attaining, in order to attain purity, you, um, uh, you, you attain purity through uh, insight knowledge. Moving to the next one, please. Also, Buddha says, purity and impurity depend on oneself. No one purifies another. And a vegetable cannot pollute your well by drinking water from it. So, you know, those are the implications. Subsequently, having attained Buddhahood, the Buddha disregarded caste distinction, which had serious implications for physical purity, impurity. He received Pindapatha, arms, from all caste and practice of, you know, the, uh, the, the whole idea of, you know, the commensality. Now, this last point, I would like to uh, you to pay your attention. Uh, Buddha uh, changed this whole culture. Now, uh, the commensality is something very, very um, uh, important sociological aspect. Uh, with whom are you going to eat? From whom are you going to accept food? So this is something very, very important. So the idea is that you accept food only from a selected group of people. And then you eat and drink only with a selected group of people. But look at the what is called the Pindapatha practice in the Buddhist tradition. Pindapatha means going for arms, arms meal. Now the whole idea is given that if you go Pindapatha, you can't skip houses. If you go in Pindapati in the street, you can't skip houses thinking that one house belongs to rich, one house belongs to poor, one house belongs to untouchable or anything like that. So the whole concept of Pindapati, that uh, idea of commensality, eating uh, together or sharing meal has been something very, very interesting aspect, uh, uh, you know, accepted in the and the practice in the Buddhist tradition. So there is no distinction in accepting food. That was the case with the Buddha and that was the case with the uh, subsequent monastic tradition. Next one, please. The Buddha's Mita Pubbangama. The disciples of the Buddha are present to see. The Viharas are Dasaniya, Pasadika, Manorama. This I briefly referred to earlier. When the Buddha is referred to, the Pali term used is Mita Pubbangama. Now, Mita Pubbangama means Buddha has a smile in his face. So, you know, this is something very interesting. So, Buddha is said to have a smile. So, I mean, when somebody comes, Buddha is uh, known to um, make the greeting first before the other person. So, he greets the person first. And then he has a smile in his face. And then there are lots of Buddhist stories where uh, we talk about how content and how happy the, the monks and nuns uh, who have attained the final liberation. So again, I want you to really see that religiosity is not something gloomy. Religiosity is not something um, austere and, you know, running from the world. You know, it's not that. That whole picture was changed here. So you here you have a smiling person, right? Not laughing really, but smiling. N nice smile in the face. So uh, similarly, absence of physical punishment in Buddhism has resulted from this attitude to body. No physical punishment for violation. Self-inflicted or other inflicted pain is not heard with the Buddhist Vinaya. Now this is another point, of course, uh, different point related to Vinaya. Uh, so the physical punishment is minimum in Buddhism. 
particularly in the Vinaya uh, for the monastic uh, tradition, for the monks and nuns, uh, there is a Vinaya tradition. But in the Vinaya tradition, it is very clear that there are no physical punishment, uh, hardly any physical punishment. But of course, there is a seclusion, uh, cutting off from the society, and you know, lots of uh, psychologically affecting uh, ways of punishment, but not really the physical punishment, per se. Next one, please. Okay, now uh, I think uh, the point I tried to make up to this point uh, should have been clear. In the Buddhist tradition, uh, Buddha tried to show that the path of purification is, can be qualitatively different from it is popular understanding. Okay, so let me come into br very briefly some philosophical matters, particularly materialism or physicalism and idealism or spiritualism. Now, these two are opposed to each other in the treatment of the body, but represent two sides of the same coin. Now, why do I say it is two sides of the same coin? Both are fundamentally flawed in the same manner. The former takes the body needs to be tempered, whereas the latter takes that the body has to be punished. Now, if you take materialism, physicalism, physicalism gives prominence to body. Now, if you take materialism in the very mundane sense, material way of living, material way of understanding the world is like, you know, you are uh, engrossed with the pleasure. Pleasure is basically associated with your physical body. And then idealism or spiritualism, where you think that you are only spirit or you are only ideal, then they, they are, for those people, physical body is not at all important. So some for one group, physical body is the only thing all that exists. The other group, it is only the ideal or the mind or the spirit that exists. So you can see that two groups are, for me, for my understanding, we, we, I mean, we can view them as representing two sides of the, you know, the same coin. What about body and embodiment? How should Buddhism respond to the modern scientific advancements in neuroscience, which seem reduce all mental state to brain functions? Now, although I raised this question, uh, I don't go into this uh, answer, this question, no, I don't even have an answer because, you know, this uh, very interesting and important uh, area of research. Uh, it's important thing is, uh, it, particularly for the Buddhist meditation, the most important aspect is, is that through psychological de development, mental development, ultimately there can happen certain fundamental structural changes in your brain. So in other words, the idea is that the meditation can be instrumental in causing certain uh, structural changes in your brain. So it means that the uh, the, the the mind can be uh, you know the very powerful uh, tool to uh, control I mean the change your body so that your behavior can be coming from both body and mind harmoniously. So there is the 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 aspect of that. But of course that I would like to leave for those people present here who know more knowledgeable about it. But nevertheless, it's a very interesting thing. But as far as my presentation is concerned, I see this uh, two poles of materialism and uh, spiritualism, either matter or spirit. But Buddhism tries to really steer clear this, uh, these two extremes. Could you please move on to the next one? Can not does Buddhism talk about person without body? To the five aggregates, panchakkam, they exist or function independently. Now, according to the Buddhist tradition, a uh, human being is uh, uh, analyzed and described as having panchakkhanda, panchaskhanda, uh, five uh, aspects. Now, this interesting thing is about the five elements, elements. You begin with rupa, material body, and then uh, rest of the four, vedana, Samya, Sanskara, Vijnana refer to the psychological aspect and also the actions. Sankara means actions, Sanskara, and then Vedana, Sanya, Sanskara, Vijnana, consciousness. So human person, according to Buddhism, is really Panchakhanda. Now the interesting thing is, 
can not does buddhism talk about person without body do the five aggregates exist or function independently actually the answer is no the five aggregates do not function uh, independently but rupa material things can exist in the world but material things particularly in the human being and also material things in the world become meaningful only with the interaction of the human being so in other words buddhism doesn't talk about uh, as far as human being is concerned buddhism doesn't talk about uh, any one or any one set of skandhas without the other so you have to have both rupa and then also vedana sanya sankara vijnana all these things all five aspects together now this shows that no cartesian type of dualism in buddhism so then we can see that according to buddhism we cannot talk about mind and body capable of existing separately as substances now this is basically the cartesian idea uh now another very interesting fact supporting this view is if you take all four aspects of mindfulness now mindfulness meditation sati mindfulness is all over the world today uh, so everybody knows about it but if you look at the uh, basic idea of mindfulness mindfulness four aspects of the mindfulness are the field of meditation and soteriology personhood is always nama rupa not mind or body alone now uh, mindfulness is basically kaya vedana chitta dhamma now kaya means you reflect on the body vedana means you reflect on feelings chitta means you reflect on thoughts dhamma means you reflect on physical and psychological phenomena now if you look at these four satipatthanas four forms of mindfulness which is considered to be the direct path to attain nirvana you can see that uh, uh, both body and mind reflection taken together is a path for meditation and then uh, also we can see that person who is always taken as nama rupa now this is i i don't have actually time to go into the into these things and uh, not mind or not body alone body and mind interact now particularly in jhanic experience you can see that when you concentrate your mind your body becomes calm when your body becomes calm your mind is concentrated so you know both body and mind aspect are interacting next one please now in buddhism the primacy of mind is uh, uh, given very much here i uh, give re- i mean caught uh, just a few instances where the dhammapada buddhism says mano pubbanga ma dhamma the mind is a forerunner of all phenomena and then in the sanyutta nikaya chittena niyati loko the world is led by mind now uh, uh nate kama yani chitrani loke sankaparago prithas kamo uh, this is not in sutta nipata actually this in sanyutta nikaya my reference here is wrong it has to be corrected sanyutta nikaya which says that a person's kama is not really the pleasurable object sankaparago prithas kamo the pleasurable pleasure is really the sankaparaga conceptual rag so the concept conceptual thing is the real rag not the pleasurable objects in existing in the world so in other words you can see that would the takes the emphasis from the external to the internal so ultimately really the karma is not the beautiful objects exist in the world karma is really the karma in your in your own mind next one please okay uh, i'm coming to the conclusion of my uh, uh, presentation uh, already uh, time is passing and we need some time for discussion now what i have been discussing so far i would like to call psychological turn now psychological turn in religion or in basically what distinguishes buddhism from the rest of the contemporary system now if you look at uh, contemporary religious systems uh, of buddhism you can see that what buddhism distinguishes from other religious tradition is basically this what i would like to call um, psychological turn however this is not done at the expense of the body now that is the most important thing let me uh, finally uh, give you an uh, 
uh, very uh, interesting but distressing episode that comes in the Buddhist Vinaya. There was a mention of a one follower of the Buddha who was uh, utterly uh, distressed, uh, disturbed by the by the sexual feelings. So finally, what this monk did was he uh, took a knife and cut his penis. And uh, you know you can see that he underwent a huge pain. And when the incident was reported to the Buddha, Buddha said that he cut the wrong thing. So uh, you know if you want to get rid of your desire, the idea is that by physically punishing, cutting off your organ is not the answer. So I, I just kept this story to the last to emphasize the Buddhist uh, viewpoint. So by physically punishing the body, you can't attain the purification. So by cutting off your limbs, you can't attain it. So ultimately, in Buddhism, neglect of body is not a sign of inner development. I'm repeating uh, the point I started my discussion. So neglect of the body is not a sign of purification. Unkept body is not a sign of advanced mind necessarily. In fact, both neglect of an overly preoccupation with body are rejected. Now, both are rejected. I mean, neither you can neglect your body, nor you can overly preoccupy with your body. So both neglecting and pampering body uh, should be uh, rejected. And the path in the Buddhist term is always a middle path, where you, know, you have, on the one hand, you maintain your body. And then as mindfulness meditation, I try to show in brief, ultimately your body can be your focus for your ultimate uh, mindfulness and liberation. So in that sense, body is not an enemy. Body is not really, a, doesn't need to be necessarily taken as an interest. So the, therefore, neither neglect your body, nor preoccupy with your body. And I move into the very last one. So with this, I would like to uh, uh, conclude my presentation. So basically, body, mind, and purification from, basically, I was trying to give it from the Theravada point of view. Of course, I do not claim uh, universal Buddhist traditions I'm not dealing with. But of course, that would be very interesting and important uh, theme for scholars to uh, be concerned about and you know be further studying. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Dilakarate. It was a real two difference. So with that, if I can open for the uh, questions from the floor, uh, if Venerable Geshela would like to say some words first, and then maybe we can have a discussion for 15 minutes. So if anybody has any questions, if you would please uh, like to raise your hand and uh, ask. Professor Tilak Rabne, thanks a lot for the very insightful presentation. Very well appreciated. Uh, just one question. Uh, we went to Sri Lanka and we saw a lot of stupas there, right? And there are Buddha relics in some of the stupas. So right. are we to understand those, those relics are considered as just a Buddha idol, Buddha image, an object of revelation? Uh, yes. Thank you very much uh, for the question. In fact, I briefly refer to the relic worship in my uh, uh, in the course of the presentation. It's very interesting. In fact, uh, I think the relic worship uh, comes from the greater Indian tradition. But you know, for a tradition which thought that uh, you know the physical body is filthy, you can ask always how could there can be physical you know the relics of a the, you know the Buddha or saint or anything like that. So it looks um, uh, in a way contradictory. However, uh, the whole concept of physical um, remains and then the object of worship, I would understand from the point of view of uh, ordinary uh, lay people, not from really the monastic point of view. If you are a meditator trying to uh, attain purification, you know, the, the, the relic worship and, you know, the worships and all these things are considered to be not that important. 
Okay, they are not. But of course, if you are an ordinary lay person, now even in the story, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, it is very interesting. Uh, when the physical remains were after the cremation of the Buddha, physical remains were taken, they were distributed by a Brahmi. That means he is not a monastic member, to not to the monastics, but to the various lay groups of people. So it is very interesting. So physical relics were not really distributed about the Buddhist monks and nuns. But so I think that is what happened. But today, of course, I should also say here, today there is no distinction between monks or nuns or lay people uh, because everybody seems to be, you know, the, the, the venerate in the Buddha relics. And if you've been in Sri Lanka, if you go to two relic uh, uh, temple, you can see lots of Buddhist monks, nuns and everybody. So it means that maybe uh, today we have, uh, we do not have uh, people who are really 100% occupied with attaining nirvana. Maybe they are following a little bit roundabout way or something. Uh, so, you know, today it is a very, very uh, uh, popular thing. So, in other words, it means that what I was trying to give you was basically a very basic and early picture of the tradition. However, I do not deny or reject, or even have a negative attitude towards the later developments. I mean, the later developments we have to understand historically, and they have served the purpose. So, you know, we have to understand these things in that perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, the the uh, from saying in pseudopsychology to uh, psychoanalysis. And how will you defend the charge of psychology? I did, Sorry, I, I, if I did, could you could you repeat the wait, wait. You, you used the phrase psychologist. Mm -hmm. How will you differentiate psychology from psychoanalysis in for this oh, particular um, yeah, actually, the, the uh, oh, okay, I, I can try and answer, although it's not directly related to my presentation. Now, uh, what I mean by the psychoanalysis basically identified Sigmund Freud, um, you know, refers to a basic uh, uh, technique of, you know, analyzing the mind. But psychology is, I'm using the term in a broader, and uh, not in the particularly the modern sense, I'm using the term in a broad sense where Buddha talks about various aspects of uh, mind as. Chitta, Mano, and Vijnana. So Chitta, Mano, Vijnana, usually given as uh, synonyms, but in fact, they are not synonyms. They refer to three different, very important aspects of mind. So the, this kind of analysis is what I consider to be uh, psychology in the Buddhist sense. And in a way, we can, if you use the term loosely psychoanalysis, we can also say that there are ways of analyzing the mind in Buddhism, but of course those are, some are similar, some are different from Sigmund Freud, Freud's method, which I'm not going to deal with, uh, I mean, no, no time. But uh, talking about which the term I use, psychological term in the in the in soteriology is the i think I, I take it as the most um, significant contribution of the buddhist thought psychological turn in the sense you know that taking the focus to the mind ultimately you purify the mind but then the problem is do minds exist without bodies no i mean minds are always embodied so in that sense, then you have to really take into body and mind together. But in that taking together, still you focus on the mind and develop in the mind. So this is what uh, Buddhist psychology is all about. The, the distinguishing point is Buddhism is not spiritualism or idealism. See, that, that, that's the, I'm not referring to um, yoga char idealism or anything, which is, uh, you know, which is not really a idealism in the, in the book and sense or anything like that. So that's a different thing. Okay. Yes. Can I ask a question, Miyam Kanna? Uh, can first Venerable Geshe-la pose a question, please? Okay. So basically, um, there are two things. Uh, one is about the uh, the relics. Mm -hmm. so the relics. They. If, I'm. I'm not too sure if Professor Sangaji, you 
you have seen those sutras which uh, one the mention of the buddha the buddha himself clearly indicating that the the, the, uh, the when the arahants when the passed, arahants mm-hmm. arahants when they passed away then the relics with the stupas will be brought correct correct it says one thing and then yeah. they uh, and then there this stupas contain the arahants relics yes so the uh, buddha mentioned the the importance of the respecting the uh the stupas mm. yes. also the relics and uh, the uh, the relics related to the uh, the stupas so it's right. not just only for the uh, lay audience but also for the monastics anybody uh, right 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 right, right. And then the uh, let's say what about same um according to the theravada tradition uh, given that today like the uh, buddhist hegemony uh, wait now what about the say the buddha mishanam chami buddha mishanam chami we we say as a buddhist you know we have to go in the refuge in the, the, the right the, right right then the uh, only when the buddha is alive we can think about this is you know the from the uh, your lecture we get the impression that only when the buddha is alive you treat him as a teacher when his path in form does go this is buddha chakra becomes irrelevant so what <coughs> how would you explain this um thank you very much and that's a, that's a very uh, the, your say, first part of the your question, i mean the remark i fully agree with you because the the relic worship and the arahant relics and you know these things are very much part of the buddhist tradition as i also try to say uh, you know the relic worship tradition has developed in the buddhism and you know which is um, you know the perfect uh, uh, you know perfect way to express religiosity so i do agree with you now when it comes to uh, your your uh, second part of the question actually uh, taking refuge uh, when the buddha is alive uh, of course we can say that we take refuge in the buddha as a person uh, however uh, in the uh, particularly in the theravada understanding and also in general understanding if you take okay buddha and then also you take refuge in the dhamma and also you take refuge in the sangha but you take refuge in the dhamma but you are not taking refuge in any, any kind of physical object so dhamma is really a something taught by the buddha existing in our conceptual world and also available if you take the sangha sangha is not particularly i mean you are a member of the sangha but of course when you say sangha sangha refers to again a very abstract body but at least we have individual members to pay our respect so not only for me not only the buddha but even dhamma and sangha are uh abstract ideas by now of course when the buddha was alive buddha was seen and then you can refer to the still the dhamma was not seen so the whole concept of taking refuge uh, uh, i mean it can be interpreted in many different ways uh, the way i see is that you take the buddha as the teacher teaching the right path dhamma as the path and sangha as the examples of those who have successfully followed the path now according to my understanding venerable geshe uh, uh, even without referring to any particular persons you can really take refuge in the sense okay this is the teacher this is the path and these are the people who have proven that it is working so i think uh, today we are supposed to be taking refuge in that more figurative and symbol sense i mean this is how i see that of course it is open for discussion okay if if i may add one more okay so basically i think that uh we can be flexible at the same time if you are being overly uh, flexible there's a danger that the dilution can happen mm-hmm. and then the next person will come with the his or her own thoughts so mm-hmm. in that way if we really relate to how the buddha uh, the uh, saw as the buddha dharma and sangha so mm-hmm. from the buddha uh, there's a the in, in fact the buddha himself as uh, a the to protect the beings the people right. at the time of dying 
Buddha made them to repeat Buddham Charanam Gachami, Dharma Gachami. And then number two, that the, the Buddha, historically speaking, uh, Buddha, even somebody as a, the, a monk, then the Buddha's own, uh, the father, he, Buddha instructed his father, who's the king, to mm -hmm. make prostration to the, the monk, who, who was a cobbler, who was a cobbler mm -hmm. before becoming a monk. So the point was mm -hmm. that there's a tremendous respect accorded to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. And then, of course, the, say the, what the real Buddha is, why? The next question comes, why this Buddha as the teacher is revered so much to such extent? Then we go to the qualities, metal qualities, mm -hmm. you emphasize so much on. Yes, that's very true. And then the Dharma, what exactly is Dharma? I won't really say it's an abstract phenomena. It is a quality of the, the person, say. Mm -hmm. when, each one of us, when we reach the stream entry level, then the once returner level, no more returner level, then the qualities are being built. So that is not built up. When you, aria, when you become right. Aria, then you are you become a definite uh, Sangha, whereas the, the, the monks and nuns, they are more like the, say, a society, uh, mm -hmm. so the societal norms you see the Sangha, representing the Sangha. So the yes. I think, you know, two things are required. One is the standard version at the time of the Buddha, how the Buddha was expect us to mm -hmm. like. And then the number two is the, the deeper philosophical connotations. And then mm -hmm. to see how that can be related to today's time. So All otherwise, right. the, otherwise the basic trend may get shattered. Like today, uh, so now the Buddha is gone, so the, uh, the Buddha Sharan Gachama is irrelevant. So this is mm -hmm. scary, quite risky also. Right. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you very much, Edward, for that explanation. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, that will be the last question, Ji. Ask your question. Professor, you tell me that uh, in the Dhamma, I mean, Dhamma text it is written that uh, 17 mind moments is equal to one body moment. And uh, one mind moment is 750 microseconds and body moment is 13 milliseconds. And when in calm abiding two couple, then only the affliction will be uprooted. I would like to have your comments. Um, Thank you very much. Um, that's uh, the, the really uh, the question from uh, Abhidhamma. This analysis of mind uh, into uh, uh, three sub-seconds forming one second, and then uh, mind uh, go undergoing that for 17 times within what uh, rupa. So if you take rupa, existence of the rupa, arising, existing, and perishing, within that, 17 thought moments are supposed to be passing, as you correctly said. But, uh, sir, whether these are uh, milli, I mean, any kind of measurement is something I'm not really um, uh, sure. In, I mean, to tell you the, put it that way. Because uh, now I see a fairly uh, substantial uh, difference between understanding anatta uh, from Chittakshana, thought moment perspective, and also the experiential perspective. Now, if you look at anatma, anitya dukkha anatma from the experiential point of view, then when we look at the reality, when we look at ourselves, you know, we see anitya dukkha anatma, particularly anitya and dukkha. None of us are born into this world like we are today, right? We all born as infants, but today we see anitya impermanence in our life. But of course, anitya we will not see just by going to bed tonight and tomorrow morning, we will not see anitya in our sense. But with the passing of time, we will see anitya. Now, when it comes to Abhidharma, Abhidharma seems to be going deeper into extreme subtle situation because if something is changing, it has to be changing all the time. If something is changing all the time, then there must be a way to uh, rationalize it. So for me, Abhidharma uh, analysis of this Chittakshana is not really a part of our experience. I don't think it is we can experience it, but it is a more to be a logical thing. 
because if something is changing, if it is not changing uh, overnight or like in a given time, if it is changing all the time, then you have to explain, I think the way to explain. But I am not I am not ruling out the possibility of some of the extremely developed meditators maybe could see this process. But okay, I don't have that experience. At the same time, uh, I think this Abhidharma analysis is meant for uh, the people, practitioners who are in a very, very uh, developed stage. Of course, all of us are trying to achieve, reach that stage. But it is only at that stage. But if you are really thinking about impermanence and you know the things uh, in the experiential level, uh, my understanding is uh, uh, Abhidharma doesn't cater into that. Those people who came to who, who realized life came to follow the Buddha. They did not come by seeing the thought moments actually. But thought moment is something subsequently you see. So I mean, don't don't misunderstand. I'm not putting down Abhidharma philosophy or anything like that, because Abhidharma philosophy is really a elaboration of uh, the basic, the, what the Buddha taught. But uh, most of these elaborations are not really, do not form part of our uh, ordinary life, unless you have attained fairly high states of meditation. I'm not sure that I answered your question. This is how I feel about it. Thank you. When he says that So it's only in calm abiding when the mind links with the body that these things are uprooted, you know? Uh, yeah, basically, I think that is why I tried to say that it ultimately body and mind cannot be separated in the practice. So abhidya, domanas, psychological things, but associated with uh, abhidya means severe desire or, um, you know, the karma. And then vyapada means, you know, the severe anger or displeasure. Now, these things are basically uh, focused on physical bodies, objects, human beings, and other beings. However, what we cannot deny is the fact that ultimately they, they are rooted in the human mind. So, but human mind, thoughts do not arise in a vacuum. So the, the, the necessary background is the material world, bodies and physical bodies. But Abhidya, so I think uh, now again, uh, I would consider uh, Abhidya Dhomanas and you know, this way of reflection always focused on the visible objects, you know, the objects of our, uh, uh, the sensory perception. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, to, uh, the, for the last question, uh, sir, I think you bought a lot of questions. You know, if you think of Shavarkas, Pratika Buddhas, <laughs> Bodhisattvas, and also, as Professor Tilakaratne said, we are talking about ordinary beings, but who knows about the level of mental development of even today, our audience. Um, there are many uh, hidden, very hidden phenomena, so we don't know. So, but thank you for a wonderful, really stimulating talk uh, and, you know, a great honor. And to all our esteemed audience, thank you for staying on. Uh, we got late, apologies for that. And of course, to the director of Tippet House, our great teacher, Venerable Geshela, and to all the staff of Tippet House. And thank you so much. Have a good evening and a good dinner. And thank you. Um, I'd just like to share with you one or two words. Um, uh, Professor Asangatila Ratna, in fact, the first time I met him was, I think, way back, like, I think, eight, perhaps eight or nine years ago in uh, Somaya College in Mumbai when he was invited there as one of the presenters for a conference and I was there also. And uh, just for information, um, what happened was that the, um, I just, I was meeting for, for meeting him for the first time and um, I already heard his, the, the fame of this professor that is very popular and uh, 
Then the, what happened was that the, he made his presentation. And of course, the presentation is so well said, I was very impressed. Then after the presentation, the, during the Q&A uh, Q question answer session, there were some young boys, young boys, so maybe you know, doing masters, whatever, in the audience. And uh, they started to attack him, attack him in verbally, really attack him. And the, I learned that, of course, uh, the, before I met him, before he, I heard him, I heard the, I already heard his fame. And then number two, that I heard him that he's a brilliant scholar. And then these young boys, they were just baseless or, un, you know, just attacking him verbally. And uh, then that was then in the form of question, during the question answer session. And then the, it was his turn. And I thought that he was going to attack him back. And the, he just uh, the, said that, he just said that, yeah, that's very true. She just ignored in a very nice way. I was so fascinated. Wow, that's something so interesting. It was his opportunity. So it was the, his talk or his last response and then finished. Then the program stopped. So they, they cannot they come up with the rebuttals. But instead of fighting back, he just said, kept it so lightly and ignored it. And then after the talk, I went to him. I told him that, wow, I'm so, this is something so beautiful that I, I saw in you. You could have easily attacked them uh, in return, but you just ignored it. And imagine what he said. He said that um, this conference, this conference, no, by no means this will be any resolution to the UN problems. So what do you what do you say? What do you fight with them? No fight. It's just waste of energy. It will not help to resolve anything of the U.S. problem, UN pro, UN problems. Wow, that's amazing. So from there, I could see that the not only just his scholarship, that is the the mental growth, spiritual growth. I can see in him. I really admire him from there to now. And then the it of course it is our karmic connection that the many times we were together uh, for for conferences meetings and so forth and yeah so this is an incredible journey to really see that uh, somebody with a scholarship usually people who are into spirituality uh, they lack the scholarship and then who have the scholarship they know more like a dry scholarship they don't really believe in what they are teaching whereas in a in the case of Professor Asanguji, I can see that um, the what he says, he believe he believes in in that. Not only that, you could see the calmness in him. You can see a great degree of calmness in him. This is what really, really, really impressed me. Scholarship plus the transformation, mental transformation. So this is what we can see in him. And uh, with this note, the uh, prof the. Uh, Professor Asangatila Biratna, thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation. And then Professor um, the Kaveri Gil Ji, it is a great, great honor that, to have you here as our chairperson and all the participants. And in fact, the I would be so keen, I would say that to all the audience, I would say that you know, Professor Asangaji, he did the touch on this area, Anatta. Anatta. Um, that would be very good if we can uh, the organize a talk, organize a lecture um, uh, sometimes in the future where we can have some kind of, le let's say, the panel discussion. Um, because they, uh, we can invite scholars, but then sometimes they don't really hit the, the target and may not really represent well the one's tradition. So um, the, I, on behalf of Tibet House, I'd like to really invite Professor Asangaji uh, to again, once more, to accept our invitation to the near future for a dialogue and your presentation on the concept of anatta. That would be incredibly um, the greatly useful to see that the two scholarships, scholarship from Theravada and scholarship from the, the, the uh, Nalanda tradition, uh, these two, the Mayana tradition and the Theravada tradition, they come together, and uh, not just in terms of the, the, the just the uh, practice per se, practice conjoined with the scholarship in terms of the philosophy. 
And then later on, maybe also the psychology, we can, you know, do something of this kind. So the, all the, the participants for this program, um, just um, keep in mind that soon we're going to organize uh, a dialogue on the concept of anatta, selflessness and emptiness uh, from the point of view of Theravada and from the point of view of the Mahayana. Okay, so this is our invitation to Professor Asangaji and to all the participants. Thank you so much for taking part in this program. And once more, Professor Gavariji, thank you so much. And our program coordinator, Tinsu Dramala, and our IT um, IT of the uh, staff, Tinsu Tirantudubla, and our secretary, and all the developer staff, uh, thank you so much for making this a great, 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 really warm and a successful program. Thank you, one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Geshila. And before we wind up this session on behalf of Tibet House, I would like to thank Professor Sankar Tilak Ratnaji for enlightening us in various aspects of Theravada Buddhism and uh, Dr. Kavila for chairing this session beautifully. And I also like to thank all the audiences for your valuable time. With this valuable learning from this forum, we will continue to touch our lives and our way forward. And um, if you are interested in Tibet House programs, kindly mail us at, at pc at tibethouse.in. I repeat, pc at tibethouse.in. And we'll add you in our mailing list. Thank you and good night and we'll see you soon.